Welcome to An Author's Journey, where a prominent author chats with us about their journey as a writer. Today's featured guest is author Alan Gratz, whose books capture the readers with an energy similar to that of a best friend, accented by the talents of a world-class storyteller. A native of Nashville, Tennessee, our author has written 17 novels for young readers. These include Ground Zero, Refugee, Allies, and more. Refugee was on the New York Times bestseller list for more than two years. And it was a featured book for Pernell Rip's Global Read Aloud Project in 2018. The novel has won 14 state awards, along with the Sidney Taylor Book Award, a Malka Penn Award for Human Rights Honor, and many others. According to Macmillan Publishers, our author enjoys dressing up in costume and attending science fiction fantasy conventions. It is truly an honor to have Alan Gratz join us for an author's journey today. Welcome, Alan. Hey, Joe. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. I'm, I'm surprised that we could find a little time out of your busy schedule, but I'm overjoyed that you gave us that time. So thank you. Oh, my pleasure. It helps now that I'm trapped at home. Uh, so you have a captive audience. I can't get on the road right now. Okay, good point. <laughs> Let's start out this way. I'd like to begin this journey by discussing your novel, Refugee. I read your novel to my seventh grade language arts classes in 2018 as part of the Global Read Aloud. On the days that I would read aloud, my students were on the edges of their seats. When the period would end, they would holler, no, as I had to stop to send them off. On the days I read aloud to them, the energy was similar to that experience at the Baseball World Series or the Football Super Bowl. Now, where did you come up with the idea to write Refugee? Well, thank you, first of all, for the reactions from your students. That's amazing to hear that. And, and I love to hear that. Um, I, I, I don't know if it's quite Super Bowl level, but I'll take it. Um, <laughs> but the inspiration for Refugee. So i had been thinking about writing a book about the MS St. Louis. And I knew the story of the St. Louis. And, and if your listeners are, are familiar with Refugee, then now they know it too, because I did write about this in Refugee. But to, to just briefly go over it, the MS St. Louis was a real ship. It left Nazi Germany in 1939 with more than 900 Jewish refugees on board. And it was turned away from its its original destination, Cuba, it was turned away from the United States, it was turned away from Canada. And those refugees ended up having to go back to Europe where they, where they ended up back in countries right next door to Germany in time for World War II to begin. And many of those refugees ended up being captured and taken back to concentration camps where many of them died. And I was planning on just writing a book about the MS St. Louis. I, I hadn't planned on all the other parts of refugee at this point. And I was thinking who my characters would be and what the story would be on board the ship. And around this time, my family and I took a vacation down to Florida. And uh, we got up one morning and we said, hey, let's go for a walk on the beach. And that is where we found a raft that someone had used to come to the United States. Uh, it was homemade. Uh, there, inside we found wet clothes and empty bottles of water and half eaten bags of food, anything these folks could take with them to help them survive. To this day, I don't know where it came from. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know where the refugees were from. Uh, my best guess has been that they came from Cuba. That's the closest of the Caribbean countries to Southern Florida, um, but uh, I've never known. But uh, my family and I, we were stunned by this. We walked around it, we talked about it. It made us think about all the things that we took for granted, the roof over our heads, the the food on our plate, the freedom and safety that we enjoy as American citizens. And me personally, I was like, wait, what am I doing? I, I was gonna write a book about refugees 75 years ago. Why am I not writing a book about this right here? We've got refugees right here, right now, a hundred yards away from where I was sleeping last night. Why am I not writing that story? So at the whole, the whole time that these two now competing thoughts were bouncing around in my head, I was also watching on the news images of the Syrian civil war and the Syrian refugee crisis. And uh, the Syrian civil war has been going on since 2011. As of our recording right now, it is still going on. Uh, it, it was at the height, what you might call the height of the Syrian civil war back then when I was watching this on the news. I was watching as 
the Syrian government fought Syrian rebels and ISIS was trying to take over territory in Syria and Kurdish rebels were trying to take over territory there and Russian fighters were dropping bombs on the country and American battleships were firing missiles into the country and caught in the middle were the Syrian people. Uh, and I started to learn more about that and saw how uh, something like 12 million Syrians have lost their homes and half of those folks have left their home country looking for refuge somewhere else. So I'm watching all this and I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, first I wanted to write a book about Jewish refugees. Then I wanted to write a book about Cuban refugees. Now I wanted to write a book about Syrian refugees. And I was like, which of these stories do I write first? They're all really important. I was like, wait a minute, what, what if I wrote one book and I put all three stories in it? And that was really the, the genesis of refugee. I, I, I knew I wanted to write a book where the stories were connected in some way, but I didn't know how. And so I, I pitched this idea to my wife. I'm like, what if I did three stories? She's like, that's a big idea, but can you, can, and I said, I want to connect the families, the, 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 the characters in the story somehow. And so I would just go out on walks with my dog and think, how are they connected? How are they connected? And then I began to realize, of course, that I had, I had refugees leaving Germany to come to Cuba I had Cuban refugees leaving to go to the US and I had Syrian refugees going to Germany. I didn't quite have a triangle, but I had geographic connections. And if I could just use those geographic connections over time, then I would find a way to weave these stories together. And I did. And I don't wanna to spoil too much, obviously, for people who are listening who haven't read Refugee, uh, because I hope they will go and read it. And I hope that it that it does for them what finding that raft on the beach did for me all those years ago. I hope it takes something that's maybe invisible to them right now, the refugee crisis in the world and the refugee crisis of the past and makes it visible again, maybe for the first time or, or visible again. The issue is timeless, I agree. And I, unfortunately it is, yes. Weaving those stories together could not have been easy. What was your biggest challenge? I guess the, the, the biggest challenge in weaving the stories together was finding those touch points where they connect and making sure that they were hidden enough that it didn't feel like it was bonking you over the head with it, but obvious enough that a very young reader would still pick up on it. And I still get some kids writing to me and saying, hey, wait, is this character connected to this character? And I'm like, yes. But I think a, a lot of times, uh, a lot of times kids make that leap and they understand those connections. But the other great thing, of course, is that you and many other teachers have been putting this book into kids' hands and reading it with them and talking about it. And that allows, so, so those kids who haven't made those connections, when the teacher talks about it, they can have that aha moment like you were talking about. Now, when did you first know that you wanted to become a professional writer? Um, was, was there a time maybe when you were a student? Did you like to write when you were a student? Yeah, I've known I wanted to be a writer since I was a little kid. Um, and I've always been more of a writer than a reader. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big reader now. But, but I, uh, I often tell young people, I was not a huge reader when I was a kid. I did read. But there were plenty of other things that competed for my attention, like playing outside or playing video games or, um, or, or making up stories with my action figures or you know, playing kickball in the street or something. There, there, were, there was always something that was competing for reading time for me. And it had to be a really exciting story to, to kind of make me sit down and read it. Um, but the very first thing, so what, what I go back to is often saying, I knew I wanted to be a writer. Uh, I, actually, I knew I wanted to be a storyteller. Let's put it that way. So I was five years old when the very first Star Wars movie came out. Star Wars, yeah. we now call it A New Hope. But back yeah. when I was a kid, it was just called Star Wars. That was exactly. it, right? Han and Luke and Leia and Chewie and the, and the droids. Yep. I, my mom would drop me off at the movie theater and I would go and I would watch it over and over again, like back to back to back shows at the movie theater. And then I would come home and I would go out in the backyard and I would pretend to be Han Solo or Luke Skywalker and have adventures. But I wasn't reliving the movies, I was making up my own stories with those characters. And what I was really doing was I was creating fan fiction. There wasn't a word for it back then, or if there was, I didn't know it, right. but I was, and, and I wasn't writing the stories, not to begin with, I was very young. I was just imagining those stories. I was taking those characters and this world that I fell in love with and creating my own stories for it. And that was my first taste of 
storytelling and I loved it. And from that point on, I started creating my own characters and my own worlds. And then sometimes I would write those stories down. Sometimes I would try and film them. My parents had an old uh, like a 16 millimeter camera and I filmed my action figures doing stories and that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, but, but that led to me really continuing to be a storyteller through grade school and through middle school. I worked uh, uh, writing stories and in high school, I wrote stories and plays. And when I went to the University of Tennessee, I studied creative writing because I really was on this path of becoming a storyteller, a fiction writer from a very young age. It sounds like the, the writer's bug has been with you then for a long, long time. Indeed. And I, I think to end up in the, the place you are now, that would have to be part of the equation to just drop from, from whatever you happen to be doing and say, okay, I'm ready to write now. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty amazing. I get to wake up in the mornings. I get to walk down to my office, which is where I'm talking to you from right now. And I get to work on writing books all day long. And I, it is, it is my dream job. It, it, I, it, it's the best job in the world, I think, besides being independently wealthy, I suppose. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, but, but I, I love it. And, and it's what I've wanted since I was a little kid. I didn't know when I was a kid if the storytelling would be writing for TV, writing for movies, writing comic books, writing plays, um, writing uh, sports stories, because I love sports too, you know, writing nonfiction about sports, but other people's stories, uh, or if it'd be write, writing novels. I loved all of those things. Uh, and it, it, it just happens that, that, that what stuck for me as an adult writer is writing books and writing books for young readers. Now, you mentioned sports. Uh, you have books named Samurai Shortstop, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and there seems to be a very intentional reference to baseball oh, yeah. there. Uh, oh, yeah. And, and let me ask you, uh, why baseball? Are you an avid baseball fan? So, you know, I played Little League Baseball when I was a kid. I was terrible at it, just terrible. And this is part of the other part of my story is that uh, I come from a very sports-oriented family. My father played football for the Air Force when he was stationed in Germany and was the high school football coach at my high school for 20 years. And my uncle played football for the University of Tennessee. So my family expected me to be a big time athlete when I was born. Unfortunately, I turned out to be the worst athlete the family's ever seen. <laughs> and uh, it was pretty obvious to everybody right off the bat. Um, see, I even use a sports metaphor to talk about it. Uh, I love sports. I love playing sports. I love watching sports. Uh, I love reading about sports and writing about sports. I'm just terrible at playing them. Uh, so yes, I, 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 I've been interested in baseball since I was a kid, but really my, my deep love of baseball came about in high school, weirdly. Uh, I, I was a baseball card collector then okay. and, and, uh, and really became a huge fan of Major League Baseball and Minor League Baseball at the same time. And um, I've continued to be a baseball fan ever since. My, my love of baseball has waxed and waned uh, a little bit. I, 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 it's always been a love of baseball, but sometimes I'm more into it than other times. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I, I love writing about baseball too. I think one of the things that appeals to me the most about writing about baseball is baseball itself is built like a story. So we often talk about, we talk about a writer's journey, which I, I love is, is the name of your podcast. Talk about a, a journey that a character takes. They leave home, they have an adventure, and then oftentimes they return home at the end. And if you think about baseball, you start at home plate, and if you're lucky, you get to go to first, second, third base, and then return home when you finished your voyage on the base pads. And I think that, that baseball has, has built in story structure to it. And uh, I, I love that about baseball. Um, I, I, I probably think overthink sports. I, I think football has become such an American sport uh, because it's about the acquisition of land. <laughs> you, move, you keep moving forward and acquiring land and territory and it's very imperial. Um, but, uh, but baseball has a, has a leave home, have a, have a journey and come back, right? And I think that's the, uh, the subtitle to The Hobbit is there and back again. And that's kind of what a baseball player does if they're lucky. Now, your admiration with, with baseball, with sports in general, sort of leads me to your next question because it deals with research and those who write about baseball or who are interested in baseball are constantly reading about it, writing about it, and, and just submerging themselves in it. And I know that the research that you do for your books is, is quite extensive. Uh, you don't just sit down and, and maybe take one or two facts that you happen to come across online and say, okay, that's my inspiration. 
you really get deep into the, the structure. Um, so let me ask you, what's the typical amount of time you spend when researching for one of your books? I, I'm sure it's more than just a day or two. It is definitely more than a day or two. You're right. I can't, I, 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 that's where I start is with an idea. And, and, and a notion of where I want to go. Like when I was talking about refugee thinking, oh, wait, what if I did a story of a family from each of these places? But then, whoa, once I have the idea for three different families in three different time periods in three different parts of the world, then my research journey begins. And I have to go, the first stop is the library. And I check out a ton of books. I bring back a big old stack of books to my office and I sit down and I read those and take notes for months. And while I'm reading these books, I'm looking for the larger context of a story. I'm looking for descriptions of places that my characters will be going to so that I can bring those to life on the page. I'm also looking for firsthand accounts of people who've been through those experiences so I can understand what happened to them individually and what their emotions were like, what their feelings were like as they went through that. So I'm collecting all this information. And while I'm doing that, I also have a different uh, a page open on my computer and I call it like I ideas for scenes from refugee. Let's say if I'm working on the book refugee. And at this point, I probably don't even have a book title. I just say the refugee novel, uh, which you know, basically became its title. But so I, while I'm researching, I keep a different file open. And let's say that I read about a fam, a Syrian family who have paid a driver to take them through Macedonia in a car. And they pay the person to get in the car and they fall asleep in the car and the car is halfway through Macedonia when they wake up because the car is stopped sooner than they think. They wake up and they look up and the driver is pointing a gun at them over the backseat of the car. And he says, I want 150 euros and then get out of my car. So now they have to pay him and they get stranded in the middle of nowhere in Macedonia and they've... They, 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 have, I, 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 they have to deal with the situation. So I read about this. This really happened to a family. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that would make a great scene in my book. And so I put that, I, I not only take notes about it, detailed notes in my research, but I also go over to this other page and I say, what about the family is halfway through Macedonia and somebody sticks a gun in their face and takes money from them and leaves them, abandons them on the side of the road. Well, that became a scene in Refugee, as you know. Yes, yes. And uh, so I make a list of all these different things that could happen in my book. Some of them won't fit because it's just not going to fit in this story the way I put it together. Um, but many of them will. And when, I, when that document gets to a point where I feel like I have enough to build a story, then I stop and I go to a big board I have in my office and I take little note cards and I write out each of those different scene ideas that I had. And I start to pin them up on my bulletin board to say like, where would this fit? And where would this fit? And this is when sometimes I decide something doesn't fit and it goes out. But I start to build the story for my characters. Now there's still gonna be holes and I have to go back and do more research or, or, or develop more of a story to get from point A to point D, for example. Um, but I start to build my story that way. And, and that's, it's a good way for me to know when to stop researching is like when I can see the beats of a story coming together. So once I have that outline built, now by this point we're about, so it takes me two or three months of research at, at a minimum. Uh, if I'm lucky and I, and I figure out which direction my story is going. Sometimes at the beginning, it takes me a while to figure out where the story is going. And so I end up doing some research that I end up having to throw out at the beginning because it just doesn't have any bearing on my story. But let's say two to three months for research and then another month to build the outline. So we're up to four months now. Then I can usually write a first draft of a book in one month, just one month to write a whole first draft of a book, 300 pages, because I've done months of preliminary work to get to that point. So now I write the first draft and I'm done, right? Woo! <laughs> Not even close. No. no, unfortunately I have to turn it into my editor and then she reads it and she writes me back this letter and says, Alan, this is the, be this, this is the best book you've ever written so good. Now here's everything that's wrong with it, right? <laughs> you, saw where, you saw where it's coming. So it's like a 10 page letter of everything that's wrong with the book. And my job is to go back and rewrite it, of course. So this is what you do as a teacher. You hand stuff back to kids and make them nice. do the same thing. So I go back and I rewrite it. Now at the beginning of the revision process, sometimes I'm, I'm making wholesale changes, changing out major like main characters or making big changes to the story. And, I, and we go back and forth. I will rewrite it, send it to my editor. She sends it back. 
And sometimes we go through this process seven, eight, nine times. But by the end of it, I'm usually working on just one chapter or one little part that's not working. So the big structural changes come first, and then we get narrower and narrower and focused in on the pieces that just need that extra little bit of work. And finally, we're done. So you, uh, 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 this whole process often takes uh, more than a year. So it's usually a year and a half to a year and nine months for me from the moment I start working on a book until the moment my editor and I say, that's it, we're done. We can't make this any better. So uh, it's a long process. I often tell kids when I'm doing school visits, imagine taking the last thing that you wrote for English class and rewriting it over and over and over again for two whole school years. Uh, and, and I ask him if that sounds like a lot of fun. And for the most part, they say no. <laughs> <laughs> can't imagine why, gee. I can't imagine why. I, I love it though. And um, there are parts of the process I like better. I love the research and outlining and first draft phase. Hate revision, just can't stand it. I know other authors who are intimidated by the blank page and it takes them forever to write a first draft. But once they get a first draft, they love getting in there and rooting around and changing things and, 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 and adapting things and revising things. They, they, they need the raw materials on the page to really get their creative juices flowing. For me, I like the blank page and building the story from scratch, but every part of the process is essential. Have you had the experience where you're going through a piece and debating, should I leave this in? Should I leave this out? You decide, oh, okay, I'm, I'm gonna leave this out. The book gets published. And suddenly you start thinking, you know, maybe I should have left that in. I, I think yeah. it would have made the book a better book. Yeah, you know, so there are definitely things I have to cut out. Uh, let's take Refugee, for example, again. So I had written up passages that I really loved. Uh, all through the book, each of the kids and their families, uh, they, have, they have nuclear families that we meet, moms and dads and brothers and sisters. And I had written in my very first drafts of Refugee, uh, second person passages where it would say like, you are Joseph. You, your father has just been taken away to a concentration camp. You are now the man of the house. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and, and it, these passages were about a half a page to a page. They weren't very long, but it, but it directly said, you are Captain Schroeder. You have a ship full of Jewish refugees and nowhere to take them. And you've got pressure from the Nazis who were on board your ship uh, to, to, to not see these people to safety. You have pressure from the Jews on board the ship to get them to safety. And you have your own personal code of ethics that says that you will always see your passengers to a safe harbor. What will you do, right? And, and, and I invited characters to literally step into the shoes of the characters on the page. And I did this, there was only one passage for each character, but I had enough characters throughout the book that I could space these out. And there were, there were these different passages all the way through. And I loved them. I thought it was really unique and I hadn't seen it done in a book before. And I was very excited about this. And my editor was like, no, this is really strange and you have to take it out. And I, I really liked it, but, um, but I ended up, she, she made the good argument. And, and this is part of what having a great editor is about is that we have a conversation about the book. It's not her telling me to do stuff. It's her saying, I see what you're doing here, but this part isn't working and here's why. And then my job is to either fix it so that it works or take it out if it just isn't going to work or like make my argument for why it should stay in. And I, I, I stuck with this a cup through a couple of drafts and I kept saying, I think it really will work. I think that this will be a great way to, to make kids really empathize with the characters. And eventually she won the argument by saying, but it pulls us out of the narrative. It, it, it pulls us out of the story and we wanna keep going with the story as much as possible. She also had the good argument that it's already three different points of view and three different time periods. And for some very young readers, that's already a lot to handle. And then throwing in second person passages on top of that was just an awful lot. So they came out. Do I think it would be better with them? Probably not. I think, I think my editor, Amy Friedman is right that it was better without them. Do I love them? Yeah. And I'd still put, I still recycled some of the stuff that they had talked about and done into the book, but just not in second person. When you're in the process of writing your novels and you're thinking of your characters, do you try to base your characters on people you've known or do you think about the characters and the storyline and try to fit one to the other? 
I often start with story first. And I know there are other authors who start with character first or even mood or setting first. Uh, But for me, it's always story. And so um, I'm always looking to find the right character who will be the the person that this story has to be about. I had a really good editor at the beginning of my career, Liz Wineski at, at Penguin, who, um, who, would, who would challenge me and say, why does this story happen the way it does? Like, I'm trying to think of how she would, how, how best way to put this. Why is this character the only person this story could happen to? For example, if you were to take uh, the Harry Potter books and if you were to drop Percy Jackson, the character into Harry's spot, would the story be the same? It shouldn't be, it should be very different and vice versa. Yeah. But if you could take another character and drop that character into the Harry Potter character's place and they do the exact same thing, then maybe that character wasn't unique enough, wasn't interesting enough, wasn't their own person, wasn't three dimensional. So that's something I've always had to remember is why is this this character's story? And so uh, I really challenge myself once I know what story I wanna tell, why, why is Joseph the only person who could be the main character of his story in Refugee? Why is Isabel the only one who could be the main character of her story? Why is Mahmoud the only person who could be this main character of his story? With Mahmoud's story, for example, he's a character who has been bullied as a kid. And so he's learned to be invisible. And what is his story about? It's about being visible. It's about making sure that he is visible enough that his family gets the help that they need. But he personally, is already is challenged by by the fact that he doesn't want to be seen by people. He'd rather he'd rather hide out from people and not be hurt than be seen. So he has to overcome his own personal issues to help his larger family issues. And so that to me is Joseph wants to very much be a grown up and be the responsible man in his family. Well, what happens when he gets his wish at the end and and being responsible could be very dangerous to him, right? Instead of maybe wishing he could go back to being a kid. So I I always try to think about, I I start with story and then say, who's the best character to fit this story? I'm listening to you describe Joseph and Isabel and Mahmoud and, and, and how you speak about them. And they seem to be alive. They seem to be people that you have experienced. And I, I guess that's part of that creation that, that authors need to have. They need to have that connection with a character in order to uh, flesh the character out and, and let that character do the things they wish to do. Do you agree? I think so, absolutely. Look, I've lived with these characters. I lived with them for, for a couple of years while I was writing about them, uh, researching them and writing about them. And then I've lived with them uh, ever since in talking about them and, 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 uh, and sharing this story with young readers. So. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I live with my characters for a long time. And then it's also important to me that they feel like they have lives off the page. I often have young people write to me and say, what happens to this character, you know, after the story ends? And I'm like, I I don't know, but I'm glad that you think that they're out there having a life somewhere. (laughs) To to me, they they were a fictional character and, and, and I was with them for part of their journey. And, 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 and then I left, I parted ways with them. Uh, But for many kids, they're like, wait, you know, but, but what's the next part of their journey? And I'm like, I don't know. I, I, uh, I haven't explored it with them yet, but, but perhaps they're off living it somewhere. Is there a character that, that you found to be the most endearing character to you? And, and on the other hand, is there one with whom you struggled the most to try to develop? That's great. Uh, so when you talk about the characters in Refugee, for example, all of them have a little bit of me inside them. Um, you asked earlier if I've ever written anybody into as a character into a story that I've met, and the answer is no. I, I've never literally, except for Prisoner B three zero eight seven, which is literally about Jack Gruner. It is, and it says that on the cover. It is, it, it's me talking with Jack Gruner about his uh, his him surviving ten different Nazi concentration camps right. during World War II, and I and I help him tell his story there. Otherwise, all of my other books are fictional characters, and. Um, I try. I do take elements from uh, of, of of people I know and elements from my own life and put them into those characters. But no, none of my characters has ever been lock, stock, and barrel. The entire person that I knew just dropped into a book. Uh, with refugee, for example, Joseph wants to grow up and uh, he wants to be treated like a man when he's a boy, 
and I desperately wanted to be older when I was a kid. I carried a briefcase to school. Um, I, uh, I, uh, I, uh, when I was on a field trip once, I bought a copy of the Wall Street Journal at the convenience store. When everybody else was buying gum and candy, I was like, hook me up with one of the Wall Street Journals. You know, I didn't even know what, it, what I was reading or looking at, but I wanted to be an adult. Um, and I, I desperately wanted to be taken seriously and for people to listen to my opinion uh, because I saw that in adults. Um, at, with Isabel, she's afraid that her parents are going to split. And when I was a kid, I had a lot of friends whose parents got divorced and my parents had big arguments and I was afraid that was going to happen to me too. And I put a little bit of that, uh, that fear that I had into Isabel. Uh, and then with, with Mahmoud, uh, I was also, I was often the smallest kid in my class all the way through grade school. I, I hit my growth spurt in, in between eighth grade and ninth grade year. Uh, and so for a long time, I was a small kid in class and I got picked on a lot and bullied. And I put that into that character. So th there's always a little bit of me in my characters. Now, the hardest character, the, the, the most challenging character I've, I think I've written lately uh, is Cameron Smith in Code of Honor. In Code of Honor, it's a story of a Persian American kid. His mom was born in Iran, but he was born here in the United States. And um, it, it's a thriller plot. His older brother claims credit for a terrorist attack against the US and Cameron has to go on the run trying to, um, to, to prove his brother's innocence. So I've written about a lot of characters who are from different places and have different backgrounds. That's not the thing that's weird about Cameron for me. Cameron in the book, isn't interested in going to plays. He isn't interested in reading books. He's he's a sport. He's really good at sports. <laughs> and so, while he and I share a love of sports, he's he interacts with them in a very different way. He's the he's the star of the high school football team. He, he's dating a girl who is in theater, but he falls asleep during her plays. And me, I would be totally into the play because I love going to theater. So for me, it wasn't his. It wasn't his Persian American background that I couldn't connect with. Well, certainly that was very different because that's not my background. The right. thing that I that was a real challenge for me was we liked different stuff. Like Cameron liked other things that I that I like things that Cameron didn't. I don't know that Cameron and I would have been best friends at school. And a lot of times with my other characters, I feel like we would be. That Cameron's a great character, and I think he's a great person. He just would have been in a different run in a different circle than be in high school. So. Uh, that was a, that was a bit of a challenge. I'm going to stay at the school time for a little bit because sure. I, I think that's interesting. Uh, when you were growing up, who were you reading? Yeah, so like I said, I didn't read a ton, but I did read. I read The Hobbit when I was younger, and I loved The Hobbit. And I have this book I've gone back to and reread. Uh, I actually remember reading Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in fourth grade. Right. I think a whole bunch of it went over my head, but I loved the zaniness of it. Um, I, I, I had a really, um, I, I loved uh, The Phantom Toll Booth by Norton Juster. That was a real big book for me because I loved the word play in it a, a, a lot. That was, that, that tickled me when I was a kid. And, and then a, another book that had a huge impact on me in seventh grade, and I remember because it was assigned for class, was Tuck Everlasting by Natalie Babbitt. And we read that together as a class. And so while I was doing these other books on my own for outside reading, this was a class book and it's not a book I would have ever picked up on my own. It just didn't have a cover that appealed to me. It didn't have a character that appealed to me on the surface. But when I read it, it became an immediate favorite book of mine then and now. And the big reason was when I was a kid, I was super afraid of dying. Uh, so afraid that I would stay up at night without going to sleep because I was afraid I would die in my sleep. Like it was a real, I had a real, I really struggled with this when I was younger. Once I understood my own mortality, I was frightened to death of it, if you'll forgive the pun. Um, and, uh, and I had a really difficult time with it. So I pick up uh, Tuck Everlasting. And Tuck Everlasting, as you probably know, is, is about a family that doesn't get old and doesn't die. Right. Uh, the Tuck family uh, live forever. And there's a really important scene later on in the book where Pa Tuck is talking to Winnie, who is a, a young girl who has met a boy in the family and, and is maybe wants to stay with him. But if she does, she's going to have to live forever, make the choice to live forever. And he gives her this speech about how it's really maybe not a great idea for everybody to live forever. And he has a really interesting view about death. That, that maybe death was there for a reason. It's so that the, 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 the circle of life can continue and, and 
uh, he has this metaphor of water coming into a lake and being dammed up. And anyway, I don't know that I totally agreed with him. I wish that I could have lived forever because I really still don't want to die. But it was the first time that a book written for me, for my age, had taken something that I was super concerned about and treated me like an adult and talked to me about it in a serious way. So many of the adults in my life had said, Alan, you're not going to die. Go to sleep right? Stop worrying about it. It's not going to happen for a long time. Get over it. And it's very hard when, when you're obsessed by something, when, you, when, you, when something really, really bothers you in a way that is, that is extraordinary, to get across to somebody who doesn't see it in the same way that you do, just how much it, it has a hold on you. And this book got me. I, 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 we have an expression now. You, you say, I, I felt seen. And I did feel seen. I can look back and say that now. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't have a way of saying that back then when I was in seventh grade. But I felt like Natalie Babbitt was talking to me. And again, I don't know that the message necessarily landed fully. I didn't, like be, I didn't read the book and say, I'm cured. I don't, I don't mind dying anymore. Um, <laughs> but, um, but it was the first book that I read, first thing that I had that, that really talked to me in a serious way as a grown-up about it. As a grown-up, what authors do you read in, in this day and age? Uh, are they the same authors that you were reading as a kid? Has it changed though? It's changed a lot. Uh, so I I'm an omnivore now, and I and I'm I wish I had read a whole lot more as a kid because I wish I had all that free time back, yeah. uh, <laughs> right? Um, but I still read every day, and I love reading murder mysteries and detective stories. That's probably my favorite genre to read. But my favorite series of all time is historical fiction, and it is the Patrick O'Brien, Aubrey Maturin books. The, the, the movie Master and Commander uh, was based on this series of books. They are about um, sailors in the Napoleonic War. And I got to tell you, I grew up in the mountains. I did, I, 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 I'm, I'm deathly afraid of being on the ocean and sharks and couldn't tell you uh, starboard from larboard. But I love, love, love these books. There are 20, 21 or 22 of them. And I think I've read 19 of them. And I ration them out to one a year because I don't want the series to end. Patrick right. O'Brien has passed away. He's not, there's no, not going to be any new books in the series. And I am so, I'm stretching them out. Now, of course, I'll go back and reread them. I, but I've never been a huge rereader in my life. I could probably count on one hand the books I have reread in my life. Uh, like I'm not a huge rereader, but these books I know, even though there's 20 some uh, odd number of them, I'll go back and reread them. But I'm, but I'm still so jealous of that first experience that you have with a book that I, I refuse to read them all back to back to back, even though that's mostly what I want to go and pull out of the library and, and read. But um, so I love those. And, and um, I read a ton of kids books now because uh, both keeping up with the Joneses, but also because I love them. What's the next novel you're planning to write? So right now I'm working on a novel about climate change. Uh, I have been asked by a number of teachers and young readers to write something about climate change. And that's a tough, that's a tall order because climate change is something that's happened over a long period of time. Obviously we're dealing with the immediate effects of it right now, but it is something that's happened over a long period of time. And it's not something that we, it, it, it's not like a ship full of refugees that we can, that we can, watch its progress across the ocean and, and sympathize with the characters on board the, the, the ship. It, it, it's, a, it's so much bigger. And so the, the real challenge has been how, what parts of climate change am I gonna focus on in the present day right now? Who are my characters gonna be and how are they going to be affected by climate change? And what am I trying to say with this book? What is, what is the end goal with, with this book? So right now the plan is to have four different characters and uh, in four different regions of North America, North, South, East, and West. And they're dealing with wildfires and Arctic uh, ice melting and hurricanes and food scarcity from, uh, from drought. And, and how this forces um, uh, refugee migration in some of them, uh, how it, it becomes a survival story for some of them. And then of course, how they are all connected and how 
climate change itself is all interconnected around the world. One, one thing that one country does across the world has an effect on everybody because of the way the climate works. And so um, I, I think it might be called two degrees. That's what I'm calling it right now, two degrees. Um, and uh, that may change. Book titles often change before they're done. Uh, but I'm still, I'm in the outlining phase now, research and outlining phase. I'm hoping to write that over the summer and then it would come out in fall of 2022. The layering that you do in your books, I think is tremendous. And that seems to be just part of your style. Uh, and that might be uh, something that will be your signature for a long time. I don't know that there are many authors who wish to take that on because that's a daunting challenge. That's a truly daunting challenge. Thanks. It has been. And, you know, for, for much of my career, I wrote a single point of view stories and refugee it wasn't the first book I'd written, I guess, with multiple points of view, but certainly uh, one of the earliest and certainly the biggest. And, and, and the ones I had written before had multiple points of view, but didn't weave together in the way that refugee had. And so once Refugee became this breakout uh, book for me and people were reading it as a part of the global read aloud and, and all over the place, um, not everything I've written since then has had all those viewpoints, but a lot of them have. Grenade has two characters uh, whose viewpoints merge at, at, at some point. Allies has a number of different viewpoints that tells the story of D-Day. Um, Ground Zero, my new book, has two different characters, one in the present uh, and one in 2001. And I find a way to, to weave those stories together. So it's become, it's not something I planned on, but, but, but the popularity and success of Refugee has really led me down that road. And I, it's an added challenge. One of the things about being a writer, I guess, just like anything, is you're always looking for your next challenge. You don't ever want to become complacent and, and, and just feel like, well, I'm good enough right? Every time I write a book, I want it to be better than the last. And part of that for me now is, can I juggle multiple points of view and keep you interested and keep them relevant and weave them all together and make it a novel? That's a, that's a lot of work, but it's a fun challenge. So for the aspiring writers, whether they're seventh grade students or whether they've been trying to write for 27 years, maybe, and, and are still pursuing it because they have that that fire inside them, what advice do you give them? Sure, so for young writers, I often say, don't worry about getting published right away. So many young, some, so many young writers, they know that you can self-publish, they know you can put stuff up online super fast, things, it, it ways when we were kids, there was none of this. And um, so I always tell them, slow your roll, don't worry about getting published just yet. I wasn't published until I was 30 years old and I'd been working on it since I was your age. So give it some time. You know, one thing that kids don't want to hear is slow down because they're kids. But, but as a writer, you need to work enough until you find your voice. And for me, that was, uh, how, it's, it's down to sentence structure even. Like, like, do I like long, complicated sentences? No, I like shorter, more to the point sentences. And I like to draw uh, like my impact with, with the story rather than, than flowery language where other writers are really great at that language or might, might focus on mood and atmosphere where I focus on action and dialogue. And uh, so finding your own voice and then also finding out what you, what are you trying to say? I think for the first half of my career, I was telling stories just to be entertaining and there's nothing wrong with that. I love a good entertaining story. But for me as an author, I think I had my real breakout success when I finally started saying, well, what am I trying to say with this book? What am I trying to say with all my books? Do I have, do I have some overarching themes that I'm working with all the time? Um, and that's, I think, when, when I, my writing really started to, to progress. So for, for more mature writers who've been at this for a longer time, I would say, ask yourself, do you have a, a voice? Could, could somebody pick up something that you've written and tell it's yours without your name on it? And uh, and also, what are you trying to say? For young writers who are just getting started, you've got plenty of time to find your voice. So the, the process here is write, revise, share, repeat, right? So you write something, you revise it, you got to do that, 
you don't want to, I know, but you got to rewrite it to make it better. Share it with your friends and family. Put it online if you want to, as a, on, a, on a fan forum, if you're writing fan fiction or, or share it with other, with other writers uh, on creative writing sites. Uh, but then do it again, write another story and write another story and write another story. So often kids are like, I want to write one novel and get it published. I'm like, that is awesome. But that's not even how it worked for me when I was 30 years old. So, <laughs> you know, I, I wrote two whole novels before Samurai Shortstop, my very first book. Uh, got published and sent those out and nobody ever published those. Uh, actually, it was three, but I didn't send out the first one. It was my awful college novel. But of the of the ones that I was really trying, uh, I got rejection letters uh, on the first two uh, and they've never been published. So for young, re for young writers, uh, write, revise, uh, share, repeat. For older writers, for more, for more practiced ones, what are you trying to say? And, and do you have a, have you figured out what your writer voice is yet? So it sounds like the younger writers you're saying have a purpose and, and, and practice. And for the more veteran writers, it's focus and find your voice. I think so. Practice is a big part of it for no matter what age you are. Right. But if you put in that practice when you're younger, then what you'll do is you'll internalize a lot of those tools that you need so that when you're older, those tools are already at your fingertips, literally as you're typing. And then you have the, you have more room to explore the larger questions of writing. Why am I writing? What am I trying to say? Do I have a voice now? Whereas when you're a kid, oftentimes this is why fan fiction is so great for kids to write. They can imitate somebody else's voice. And there's nothing wrong with that, especially when you're learning to write. Uh, uh, artist, uh, student artists go to museums and set up their easels in front of the masters and try to reproduce the masters. And I think that, the, the, that that's what fan fiction is. Take your favorite book, your favorite TV show, your favorite comic and try to write in that same style. And as you imitate other voices, you'll begin to find your own. When I was in college, I remember our professors uh, had us write in the style of Hemingway, Hawkins, ah. and whoever it was we were studying. And it meant so much and it gave us uh, so much opportunity to expand our vision and, and to know what the great ones were doing. And if we could maybe just learn one little bit about technique it meant all the difference in the world. So I think your, your words ring very, very true with that. That's a great assignment. And I wish more teachers would do that to, because what it does is it forces kids to look at a text in a very different way, rather than just looking at the content of the text. It's asking them to look at the style of the, con uh, 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 of the story. And I had a great teacher uh, at the University of Tennessee who, who I, I, he may have, been, I think he was quoting George Orwell or somebody else, but he told us that, that style is the window through which you view the story, right? You shouldn't yeah. see it unless you actually, like it's there. And if you put your hand out, you're gonna find it. You sh most readers are not going to see the window. They're just gonna see the story. But what you're asking kids to do when you ask them to write in the style of an author is to back up and look at the window. And I love that. Um, I, we challenged my daughter to do that for some of her favorite authors. And, and it's a really, I, I used to do it just for fun. I would write in the style of, a, of an author who had a really distinctive voice and style and imitate it. And I, I just did it for laughs, but it was really good practice because then I realized, oh, I'm really bad at some kinds of writing. <laughs> like, like when I try to imitate this person, I can imitate them, but it really sounds terrible because I can't do what they're doing. And then there are other ones where I was like, oh, I, I can kind of nail this because that's very much like what, what the voice I was developing on my own. Yeah, and hence writing is an art just as painting is an art and sculpturing is an art and uh, almost anything you do, in, including playing baseball. Truly, as well uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a craft too, though. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, it, it is a craft too, though. It's, it's an art and a craft. And so it's important to see that there, is, there are different artistic styles to it, but also to treat it like craft where you know you can get better with practice and with study. Any final words you'd like to uh, leave with our audience? I, I guess um, I, I, I've really enjoyed figuring out what I'm doing as a writer, and I've been really lucky to do that while I'm publishing. So um, I, I was—I often get asked to work with young writers, especially at places like Tennessee, where where I, uh, which is um, my alma mater. And so, like, there was a young writer who had just graduated from Tennessee, and. Um, 
uh, drove over to my home. I live in North Carolina now and, and drove over and, and met me and we had lunch and, and I said to her, you know, like, tell me about what you write. And, 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 um, and she said, I grew up in a really rural part of East Tennessee and I am writing stories that show people that we are more than just rednecks, that there's a depth to the people who live here that they don't see when they just make assumptions about us on the surface. And I was blown away. I was like, wow, here is a young writer who, if, if she keeps, think about all the different stories she could tell within that, right? She's, she's, got a, she's got something that she's fired up about. She's got an angle on the world that she wants to take and, and, and use. And she can tell many stories within that. It took me so long as an adult, I was really in awe. She was in her twenties and I'm like, dang, I, when I was in my twenties, I was just the stupidest person ever. And I had no idea, <laughs> I couldn't have said something that smart. And um, I, 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 it took me a long time to get to this place. And, I, and I'm really happy that I feel like I have, I've kind of figured out who I am as a writer. And I'm really, again, lucky that I got to do that while I was being published, that I got to be a working author who did that. But I, I really think of my books as um, social thrillers. This is a term I heard from, uh, from Jordan Peele, the, the writer and director of Get Out. Okay. He's a super smart guy. I heard, was listening to a podcast with him. And he said he wanted his, his stories to be thrilling. It kept you on the edge of your seat but also deal with social issues. And I thought that's, I've been looking for a way to describe what I was doing lately. And I thought that's it, like something clicked. And I said, I'm working on social thrillers. And so now whenever I start a project, I ask myself, is this exciting? Is it gonna keep you turning the pages? And that, that's num job number one. And job number two is, is it also going to make you stop and think and maybe want to re-examine the world that we live in and change that world? So. Uh, I guess uh, I'll, I'll leave you with that, that I, that I feel like um, I, have, I feel like I have found my calling and it, uh, for right now, at least for right now, it is writing social thrillers. Alan Gratz, thank you so much for taking an author's journey with me today. Uh, your kindness and, and your insight are both greatly appreciated. I appreciate it, Joe. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, that concludes our journey for today. And tune in again for more conversations with more authors of interest. For an author's journey, I'm your host, Joe Pizzo. Have a wonderful day.